chapter, I think it's 12. One moment. Sorry, um, not 12. It is... Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19. Sorry, let's go to verse 18. Sorry, verse 17. Okay. When I therefore was thus... When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness, or the things that I purpose? Do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. Um, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. And what that means here, okay, what that means, you know, in the Old Testament, in the law, it was all... Uh, this was, you know, you, you do something wrong, punishment, consequence, death. You do something good, blessing and reward. Your crops will be plentiful and bountiful, okay? All, so in the Old Covenant, it was death or reward. In the New Covenant, in Christ, there is no condemnation. There is a possibility for many different blessings. Jesus, when he spoke on the Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed, blessed, blessed. He didn't say cursed. There is a possibility for many blessings that we can take part in. But there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation in the New Covenant. When you're saved, you're in God's hands. And you're not going to lose your salvation. But you could miss out on a lot of things. And there's, that's what, you know, the, the author of Hebrews is getting at here and why he's giving these warnings is because he doesn't want us to miss out on something. He doesn't want us to miss out on the opportunities we have before us in the new covenant. Okay, so the word of angels is something you can trust to have consequences is what he says here. You know that what the, when the angel said something in the old covenant, they took it seriously. How shall we escape or flee if we neglect what he has told us? If we neglect what he has told us. So he, it means that Jesus' word, even though there is no condemnation come to you, you could miss out on things. That's the warning. And he wants to make, he, he wants to have you have as many blessings as possible. So again, this salvation here is deliverance to the inheritance he has for us. Okay? The salvation being spoken of in this passage, in this context, is deliverance to the inheritance he has for us. So these things were spoken by Jesus. They were retold by the apostles and the disciples. God showing that he spoke what he spoke was something we should take serious by the miracles he gave, the signs, and the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And that's how we know that we can trust what he has said. Let's go back to Hebrews now. 2 verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. When he talks about inheriting all things, the angels did not inherit all things. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man, that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor 
and did set him over the works of thy hands. So when Jesus proved himself to be worthy on the cross, God put all things under his subjection. Or at some point, will put all things under his subjection. Thou hast put, oh, here it says, thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. So in other words, yes, Jesus has proven himself worthy to have all things put under subjection to him. And the time is coming when he will rule and reign over everything. So there is, it hasn't happened yet. Jesus is not in Jerusalem right now. But there is a day coming when he will return and he will rule and reign over everything. We see then in verse number 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. So he became man. And, and it's funny, you know, the author here, he makes it very clear, and well, they already knew man is below the angels in power, in ability. You know, we face death. The angels don't face death. So we're, we're obviously lower than the angels. And Jesus became man. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him. That, that word became him means that he wanted this. It was proper. It was something he saw good to do. For it became him for whom all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect. And that word there it means complete. Okay? God was already perfect but it means complete, okay? Made perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all one, are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. The, the word there, sanctifieth, that word means, uh, it's hag iadzo, and it means to make holy, to concentrate, cons consecrate, consecrate. So it means that what he did on the cross, you are, you are not holy, I am not holy, we are unworthy, we're sinners. But what he did on the cross, okay, it says here that for both he that sanctifieth, so he can make us holy, okay, and they who are sanctified, those who have been saved, okay, those who have repented and put their faith on, the, on that, uh, what he did on the cross, um, that, that he makes us holy. Before God's eyes, our sins are erased. And then he says, are all one, are all of one, Okay, that word there, you know, it means unified. You see, when, we're, when it so says that we're the body of Christ, okay, it means we're part of him. Christ is the head of the church. When we're the body, in the body of Christ, we are part of Christ. We are all of one. We are unified with him and him as our head. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Now, this passage here, it comes from Psalms 22, 22. Let's go there. It says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation... Will I praise thee? 
Okay. So the word there, congregation, you know, God has unified us together. So the focus here that he's talking about is in the context of the church in Hebrews. He's speaking to the people who are in the church, who are serving faithfully in a church. And he's telling them, don't go back to the old covenant. Don't go back to the, the temple in Jerusalem. Don't go back to the circum following circumcision and following the sacrifices from before. Because I am here now, and I am in your midst. You coming together to meet together. We're all meeting together as one, and I'm meeting with you. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there will my presence be also, Jesus said. Going on to verse 13. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. <coughs> Let's go, we'll, we'll read this, because actually this is Jesus speaking. And Jesus in Isaiah 8, 13. We'll start at 13. It's actually before this part that's being quoted, but I, I think it's interesting to read. It says here, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel and for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And I... This is Jesus speaking here. And I will wait upon the Lord that hideth his face from the house of Jacob, and I will look for him. Behold, I and the children whom the Lord hath given me are for signs and for wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts which dwelleth in Mount Zion. Jesus is saying that we being the children that God has given him in the church. And so that's, that's where, going back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 13, where it says, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church. I will sing praise unto thee. That's Jesus speaking there. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, I, behold, I and the children which God hath given me Okay, that he's saying, I will put my trust in him, in God, okay, in the Father. Behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as, going on to verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil. So God, who before before he came to Bethlehem, before he, he came to indwell Mary and be born in Bethlehem, before that time, he was never a man. God knows all things. He is omniscient. He knows all things. He knows what it would be like to be a man, but he had never actually been a man. As far as we can tell in the scriptures, I don't no eternity past what happened, but as far as we can tell from the scriptures, he had never become a man. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He experienced the same things we've experienced. He's experienced the persecution. He's experiencing having an empty bank account. He's experiencing, he's experienced praying and God, please supply for me today. He's experienced everything that we experience. He also himself, like you remember the, the time when uh, the tax collectors came and, and they were asking for, you know, does your master pay taxes? 
and he said, well, who, who do the tax collectors tax? Do they tax their children or do they tax their, the, the foreigners? He said, well, the foreigners. He said, okay, but so that we don't offend them, you go down to this, this creek here, you get a fish, the first one you find is going to have a gold coin in his mouth and you're going to have some money there and you give that money for both of us. So he still paid his, his taxes to them. Okay. But, I mean, obviously he didn't have any money on him at that point. We've all been there, right? So, yeah, so God supplied in that case. So he's been through everything that we've been through. He's taken part in flesh. He's experienced all the pains and aches of, of being a man, being tired, being hungry. He's experienced all of that. He's experienced much more than most of us have ever experienced when he went to the cross unimaginable suffering that through death so here's one of the other reasons why he came and did all of what he did that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil he won that day he conquered Satan that day and the, the full ramifications of that will play out will play out when he comes the second time and he binds Satan and casts Satan into the lake of fire. But he's already defeated Satan. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. There we get to the, the other reason that, that was brought up of why he came and why he did all of this that you mentioned. Because that was to redeem us. All to deliver them. To deliver, that word there, deliver, is, you know, salvation. It's the same word. To deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So that's a third reason why he did all of that. See, there were multiple reasons. Sometimes we only focus on that one reason. But there were many reasons when we look through the scriptures of why he did all of this. He accomplished many things on the cross. And, and yes, redeeming us from our sins was one of them. And it was a big one. Very important one. But it wasn't the only one. There were many others. So, for verily he took on, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. So he didn't come as an angel. He, he came through the seed of Abraham. Right? And it behooved him. That word behoove there is of el, I'm sorry, of eleo. It means a duty or an obligation. Okay? He felt obligated. He felt obligated to be made like us. Not that he didn't already understand everything we feel and everything we go through. Okay? But that he might, we continue reading here, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. <clears throat> for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. The word there, tempted, means perazo, and it means proved or tested. It means trials. It's not talking about sin, but it's talking about facing trials in, in like, you know, when he was in the wilderness and Satan tempted him, okay? So, yeah, yeah, I guess temptation, if we don't, if we don't have faith, it can lead to sin. But the, the point here is that it's being proved, it's being tested. And, and each day, we also are being proved and being tested. And we can know that our Savior, so the whole purpose of this, one of the, the fourth purpose that he did all of this was so that we can know that he's not just a God up in heaven who has never experienced what we've experienced. So that we can know 
He has experienced it. He has physically, personally experienced all the same things we have. So that we can know that he understands where we're at. Not that he needed to, he didn't need to, to know that. He already knew that. He already knew what it would be like. He can, he's, God is omniscient. You know, the, the, I've heard uh, different pastors, it's always a challenge trying to get our minds around God, isn't it? We can't. Our minds are so finite that we really can't fully grasp and understand God. And I've heard some pastors uh, try to describe just how powerful God is. And they use three different descriptions. They use three different descriptions. One of them is God is omniscient. He knows all things. He is omniscient. He knows everything from past, present, future, everywhere, every time. He's omnipresent. God is everywhere. He's everywhere all of the time. He sees everything that's omnipresent. And he is omnipotent, meaning he is all-powerful. That anything he says will come to pass. Anything he does, he is in control, 100%. But, you know, there was one more I found. One more interesting aspect of God that I found. And when we go... If, let's go ahead and look at Revelation. And this one's a little bit more difficult to get our minds around because we think very linearly. In Revelation, let's go to chapter uh, 4, verse 1. As we know, this is John who is at the island of Patmos, And uh, Jesus came and visited him there. Okay? Jesus came and visited visited him there, spoke to him. And at this point, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was it, was as it were a, a trumpet talking with me. If you go back, you'll see that that first voice talking to him was Jesus, okay? Introduced himself as Jesus, okay? So just to clarify who that is, this isn't an angel. This is Jesus talking to him. Uh, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately... I was in the spirit. And behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And if we continue reading through Revelations, we're reading about things that John was taken in the future. You ever watched a movie where they've got like the time machine, and the person gets in the time machine, and they go to the future? Well, that's exactly what happened. Jesus took John in the spirit into the future to see what would happen. He personally, physically saw what was going on in the future. Okay? God not only is in absolute 100% control over, over everything, he's not only omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, but he's also omnitemporal. Temporal being time. God, he knows what everything that is, that's going to happen because he's already there. He's already in the past. He's already in the future. He's in the present. Yeah, you know, when I was a kid, we used to have these little flip books, okay? And, you know, if you take one of these blank, you know, those memo, you can take like a memo, sticky memo, and put it up on the board to remind yourself something. Well, I'd take one of these, and, you know, summertime, no school, so I'd start drawing on one, and then flip to the next page. I'd draw a similar design, but just change it a little bit. Okay? And you keep doing that. It takes forever. It takes like, you know, a day or two. And then finally, when you go and you flip this book, you have a little cartoon. And you can watch as the pages change and, and the, the scenes change. You can make a little cartoon, you know, something funny or maybe some guy hits someone in the head or something. Yeah, you know, kids, well, what do we do, right? So, God, I mean, th- in this example, God is like, he, he is outside of time. He is outside, he is not bound by time. That's why God, Jesus was able to say, come on, John, let's go to the future. He is not bound by time. 
And so God sees all the pages. He sees it all from an outside perspective that we just can't even comprehend. Okay? He sees the future. He sees the past. He sees all of that. I had a friend once ask me, just kind of a hypothetical question. And we were, we were talking about just, you know, how powerful God is. And again, we, we can never really get our full minds around God. It's impossible. But he asked this question. He said, God can do everything, right? Well, yeah, sure. Can God lie? He asked this question, can God lie? And, you know, the, the question itself is flawed. And we thought about it for many days. The question itself is flawed because the implication of a lie means there is a superior authority. The implication of a lie means that there is some superior truth. Okay? But let me tell you something. When God speaks, when his word goes out, all of creation follows. You know, there was a time when God said, light. Before that, there, was, there wasn't light. But when he said that, there was. He said earth. And there was earth. He spoke. And what wasn't became. You see, when God speaks, all of creation, past, present, and future, obeys. So it's really, the question is, is framed from our limited minds, showing just how little we understand God. That's just how powerful God is. But because God is omniscient, because he knows everything, we know God's mind doesn't change. We know that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever because he already knew everything. So he's not going to change his mind. But in his, in his omnipotence, in his power, he has given us the choice. He gave Adam and Eve the choice in the garden. Here's the tree of knowledge, and here's the tree of life. Pick one. And they went for the tree of knowledge. They wanted to become, they wanted to, as the, the Satan put it, be wise like God. Instead of going for the tree of life. He left both. There were two trees. If you study the Genesis, there were two trees there. And they had a choice. Okay, they didn't go for the tree of life, unfortunately. So, that's why he had to ban them from the tree of life. Because with the knowledge of good and evil, and being in the flesh, being able to live forever, would mean that for eternity, the situation on earth would keep degradating, and keep getting worse, and the condition would keep getting worse, and become more defiled and more defiled, so he had to limit us from being able to access the tree of life. He did that, for our mercy. He did that out of mercy. He did that out of mercy to us. So, what, where was I going with that? So, God um, gave us a choice in the garden. He gives each and every one of us a choice now to trust, to trust on him, to put our faith on him if we haven't yet, to repent and believe on him. And then when we have believed on him, when we have been, been redeemed, we have a choice how we want to live. Do we want to live to the spirit, to the things of the spirit? He's given us a new spirit a new life inside if we've been born again. Do we want to follow those things or we still have the flesh or do we want to follow after the flesh? And if we follow after the spirit and if we walk by faith, what we're going to see through Hebrews here, we have the possibility, the opportunity for many blessings. There's no condemnation, but there's the possibility for many blessings through Jesus Christ. Okay. Thank you. We thank God for the salvation.